We've said from the beginning that the book of Genesis is a book of firsts. And in the first 11 chapters, events predominate. And sadly, one of the first things that happens is the first murder. We have the first births, the birth of Cain, the birth of Abel, and the first murder. Murder is a particularly anti-God sin. Murder is an act of uncreation. Murder is an act of overruling God. Murder says, God, you put this person on the earth. You did the wrong thing. I'm going to take this person off the earth. That's what Cain does to his brother. We see many things in the pattern of this murder. One thing that we see is that there's no justice on the earth. Justice is in heaven. The righteous man dies. The unrighteous man lives. It's the easiest thing in the world to walk through the earth and to see certain people who are healthy, certain people who are rich, certain people who live a long time, and to think that they're being rewarded. And that people who are not healthy, who are not wealthy, who do not live a long time, are somehow being punished. In the very first generation, we are shown that that is not true. That is not a way to think. There was a way of uh, interpreting Old Testament theology to suggest that that is true. But Jesus taught that that's not true. And we're taught in Genesis 4 that that's not true. It's the righteous man who suffers. It's the righteous man who's killed. Now what happens, we talked about this business of asking questions to teach, beginning when God says to Adam, where are you? We see another series of questions when God comes to Cain after the, the murder. In Genesis 4, 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? First of all, he's not only a murderer, but he's a liar. You'll find that sins are almost never alone. They travel in convoy. They travel in groups. One sin accompanies another sin. The first sin makes the second sin easier. And after all, being a liar is a fairly easy thing if you're willing to be a murderer. So Adam and Eve tried to cover up their sin with the, the leaves from the trees of the garden. Cain tried to cover up his sin with words, with lies. Both are inadequate. Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Well, he didn't know where his soul was, that's for sure. But he certainly knew what had happened to his brother, and he was lying to God. Adam and Eve hid from God. Cain lied to God. And he even turns the tables on God and asks God a question as if he's accusing God. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to keep my brother alive? God says in verse 10, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Okay, now, this involves a curse on a person. Now you are cursed from the ground, which you who, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. He goes on to talk about the difficulty Cain will have and the fact that Cain will be in exile and a wanderer. Cain says in verse 13, My punishment is too great to bear. And he also complains in verse 14, I shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and it will come about that whoever finds me will kill me. In other words, the punishment that he gave his brother for righteousness was not too great to give. But the punishment that he fears for unrighteousness is too great to get. You see, sinful people are never just in their judgment. They always believe that they're being handled too severely when they're quite willing to handle innocent people even more severely. And they're also quite willing to accuse the righteous and holy God. Now, what follows is a great mystery to us. Let us call it the mystery of providence. 
Providence is God's goodness, God's gracious provision. Providence is, is God's provision for all people. Let's think for a minute of the context we find ourselves in. The good man dies. The wicked man lives. The true worshiper dies. The false worshiper lives. Now yesterday I shared something with you which has to do of, with our difficulty in accepting God's judgments. Our temptation to overrule God. Our temptation to conclude that what God has done is not fair or that God had, should have done it differently. God should have done it our way and not His way. And I shared a principle with you. I also shared these principles when we studied the Gospel of John together because they're very important when we studied the death of Lazarus, Jesus' close friend. The principle I shared with you yesterday was if I knew what God knows and I don't know what God knows, and if I were good and I'm not good, but if I knew what God knows and if I were good, I would do what God does. I would allow what God allows. Now, let me today share with you another principle which is like that. It's like that in the sense not that it removes all our problems, answers all our questions, solves all our difficulties, but it's like that in the sense that it helps us to respond to our own pain and our own difficulty whenever something happens that we don't like whenever something, somebody's suffering that we don't want to suffer, whenever somebody dies that we don't want to die. And here the good man has died and the bad man, his killer, is kept alive. And we're going to see that principle deepen in a moment. But first let me say this. God will not prove His love to you and God will not prove His love to me by protecting me from suffering and death or by protecting someone I love from suffering or death. Did you hear what I said? God will not prove His love to us by protecting us or those we care about from suffering or death. Now, understand what I did not say. I did not say that God would not protect us from suffering or death. I did not say that God would not protect those whom we love from suffering or death. Are you alive? Is there someone whom you love who's alive? That's because God protected them from death. That's because God protected you from death. Is someone you love healthy? Is someone you love free from suffering? That's because God has preserved their health. That's because God has protected them from suffering. I did not say that God would not protect us or those whom we love from suffering or death. I said God will not prove His love for us by protecting us from suffering or death. I also did not say that we could not ask God to protect us or those we love from suffering or death. We believe in prayer. We believe in intercession. And God sometimes answers those prayers when we ask Him to protect us or those whom we love from suffering or death. I said that God will not prove His love for us by protecting us from suffering or death. Now there's a very simple reason for this. And the reason is that God proves His love for us in another way, in a different way. God proves His love for us by refusing to protect the one He loves from suffering or death. Do you understand that? That's the way God proves His love for us. By refusing to protect His Son, His only Son, from suffering and death. It is by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, His wounds, His blood, His suffering, 
that God proves His love for us. So if we insist that God prove his, proves His love to us another way, we say, well, it's obvious that God doesn't love us because I'm suffering. It's, God that, it's obvious that God doesn't love me because this person that I cared about died or this person I care about is sick. So that just shows that God doesn't love me. No, 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 no. When we say that, what we're saying is that the death of Jesus is not enough. The death of Jesus is not a sufficient proof of God's love. And in this case, God does not protect the righteous brother. God, God does not protect, protect the good brother. Now, one, one reason I'm mentioning this, providence is not only mysterious because God does not always protect righteous people or good people or suffering people, but providence is mysterious because God sometimes does protect unrighteous people. And what we see in Genesis 4, look at verse 15. The Lord says to Cain, Therefore whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, lest anyone finding him should slay him. God took protective measures for Cain. Now here's the question. Why didn't God take protective measures for Abel? Why does He take perfect, protective measures for the killer, for the false worshiper, for the bad man? Well, let me just say this. It was because Abel was like Christ. And the book of Hebrews says that Abel was like Christ. For the same reason he didn't take protective measures for his own son to show us a picture of something. The true worshiper dies first so that the false worshiper will have an opportunity for grace. Now, we have no indication that Cain ever did come to grace. We have in the Old Testament a pattern of carnal people who are carnal in just this way. They have access to the truth. They have access to the Spirit of God. They have access to the truth of God. They have the access to godly people. But they themselves are not godly. We see that in Cain. We will see that in Ishmael. We will see that in Esau. We will see that in Lot, all in the book of Genesis. Later in the Old Testament, we see it in Saul, the first king of Israel. Men who have enormous privileges, who've been made the steward of great blessing and great truth, but they still live apart from the law of God. They still refuse the entreaties of the Spirit of God. They choose to sin, even though they've given opportunities to be righteous. So Cain becomes a wanderer. He has a family. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. I don't know how it is in Russia, but in the West, people love to ask questions that they think prove the absurdity or the incoherence or the impossibility of the biblical claims or the, or the Christian faith. And here is one of the, I mean, we, we talked about one of those questions on Monday when we asked the question, well, where did the light come from on day one, day two, and day three when the sun is not created until day four? There are unbelievers who ask that question and they believe they've disproved the Bible. Well, another question that unbelievers ask is, where did Cain get his wife? Because it says in Genesis 4, verse 17, that Cain had relations with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. He built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. Now, in a very few minutes, we're going to see how long people lived. And one thing that's very, very obvious is that when we're told that Adam and Eve had children, that they had a son named Abel, they had a son named Cain and they had a son named Abel. And we're told when other descendants of Adam and Eve have children that we're not told the names of all the children. 
that we're not told about everybody. And we're going to talk more about that in a moment. When we think of the idea that, that Cain had a sister for a wife and that Cain had children through his sister, obviously that's a terrible thing for us to think about. Well, let me mention two things. We have a saying in English, I don't know if you have the saying in Russian, and that is that a river is more clean at its source than at, his, than at its mouth. The source of a river is the place where a river begins. The mouth of the river is the place where the river ends. When I lived in America last, I lived in Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis is on the Mississippi River, the mightiest river in North America. The Mississippi River begins, in America at least, I think in Minnesota. The Mississippi River ends in New Orleans, where it's poured into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, if you're going to drink water from the Mississippi River, you'd much rather drink water in Minnesota than in New Orleans. The Mississippi River is much cleaner in Minnesota than it is in New Orleans. What am I saying? At the beginning of our race, there was a much greater purity in our race than there was in later generations. There was no law against incest yet. When we see how long Adam and Eve lived, it's very possible that they had hundreds of children. And the reality is, in later generations, there would have been much greater difficulty, much greater medical risk in marrying a sister than in those first generations. The idea is repugnant to us, it's repulsive for us, but if the human race began with two people, then if the human race was going to continue, then there had to be marriage between the, ch the children of those two people. There was no other choice. And so that's, that's the answer to the great question, where did Cain get his wife? Now, um, by the time you get to the generation of Lamech, in verse 23, which I think is the seventh generation, although I'm not counting. Uh, we see the beginning of uh, polygamy and we see another murder. And we not only see Lamech having two wives, and we not only see Lamech killing someone, one of his brothers or one of his cousins, but we see him boasting about it. We see him composing a poem and a song about it. Verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zilah, Listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. And basically, again, he's taking the place of God. He's saying, I'll decide who lives and dies, and I'll decide who's protected and avenged. God won't do that. I will do it. There's another reason why God protects Cain, apart from just the fact that God is a gracious God and He's giving Cain an opportunity to repent. God will be the Lord of vengeance. God will decide who's punished and how people are punished. Now it is true that God has given a role of justice to human government. But that is a role of justice. There's a difference between justice and vengeance. Vengeance always belongs to God. It's something that He determines. We could talk about that maybe some other time when we have, have time. Now verse, by verse 25, Adam and Eve are given another son. Adam had relations with his wife again, and she, she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed, killed him. We got married in 1977. Today's my wife's birthday. We were married in 1977. We had our first child on March 1st, 1979, a little girl. By the beginning of 1981, really by the end of 1980, no, 
by the beginning of 1981, we were expecting a second child. And we were expecting a little boy, and we were going to name him Luke. But that child died in the womb within a month of his due date. So he was born dead. We did not name him Luke. We named him Michael, which means one who is like God. Because according to Matthew 13, and this is what I mentioned, these are the words that I spoke over him before we buried him, that now he shines like the sun in the kingdom of his father. He's like God. So we named him Michael, which means one who's like God. My wife conceived again in 1984, and it was going to be a little boy. And we had always planned to name the next son Luke, because that's what we wanted to name the child. But when he died, we named him Michael, and we decided we were going to name the living child Luke. But when the child was born in 1984, we decided to name him Seth, because of Genesis 4. Because God had sent a replacement for the son that we lost. That, that little boy is now 26 years old, and he's getting on a plane today to fly to Budapest. And God willing, I'll see him Saturday night. But um, God gave a consolation to Eve. He gave Eve another son, a son to replace the son that she lost. She says in verse 25, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. Verse 26 says, To Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord.